Okay, Shankar, thank you so much for making the time once again. The last time we did this, we discussed low wall and momentum and like you mentioned uh, right before we started recording, a uh, lot of people actually reached out even on the comments and uh, on other forums saying that this was one of those uh, really good conversations because you brought the practitioner's insight on how factors are made, you know, what goes on in the kitchen, so to speak. Uh, so last time we spoke about low volatility and momentum. Uh, momentum has become, I mean, since the time we spoke also, it's become a lot more popular, partly because of the events. But uh, this time we'll go to the uh, OG factors, so to speak, uh, yeah. starting with value. But, but before that, uh, you know, just so that the people listening for the first time have some context, like in the simplest uh, terms possible, uh, what exactly is smart bit or what 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 are factors what are we talking about absolutely uh, thanks thank bhuvan thanks for again inviting me to this conversation um, so to kind of reiterate some of the points which i made last time also and i think this is a uh, i think common refrain for both of us that we dislike the use of the term smart beta uh, and at the cost of repeating myself i will say if something is smart beta then that by <laughs> corollary means something has to be down beta. Right, 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 right. And I don't think there is anything down absolutely in investing in beta, which is investing in the market. Right. So I would like to kind of uh, always use the term factor investing uh, because it is trying to capture some, it is trying to explain maybe some additional source of risk. Uh, and it's a reward for taking on that source of risk. Or it is, uh, you know, trying to capture some behavioral anomaly. And uh, because that behavioral anomaly can either uh, not be, has not yet been uncovered, or even if it has been uncovered, there are institutional limitations to kind of uh, arbitraging them away or diluting them away. Uh, there's a return associated with it for the people who are able to take it hold to that anomaly. So that is essentially smart beta or factor investing is actually just trying to capture one of these two things. Oftentimes, it is both of these two things in varying proportions. And as an investor uh, or as a researcher even, inordinate amount of time is spent in trying to understand what is the underlying cause for why an uh, anomaly exists or a premium exists. Uh, I would say it's an important conversation, but it's perhaps not the most important conversation. The most important conversation is to accept and acknowledge that, okay, there is something which exists. Maybe we don't understand 100% of it, uh, but let us respect it. Whether we want to trade it or not is a completely different question, but let's respect the existence of something. So I think uh, the whole uh, question of factor investing or smart beta investing falls under that broad definition. Got it. I think last time we spoke, Oh, I forget, maybe it was about a year, year and a half ago. So you're saying since then there's been no consensus on what drives factor returns in the factor investing world. I'm shocked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there wasn't any consensus for maybe the last 10, 15 years before that also. Since we, uh, because, see, uh, for a long period of time, this is my understanding, I could be wrong here, but for a long period of time, at least in the, academic world or the brainy part of the world, something could be considered a factor only if there was a risk-based explanation for it. Right, right, right. Meaning that it was a reward for taking a certain kind of risk. Right. right. But that essentially meant that you were ignoring reams and reams of evidence uh, with respect to momentum investing, for example, with respect to what we want to discuss today on quality investing or low volatility investing, which we, invest, which we spoke about last time. After a point in time, it starts. It stops being funny, right? You you can ignore data only until a point, right? And after that, you've got to, you know, as a practitioner, of course, it's uh, increasingly people have started uh, embracing the idea that uh, you know there can be something which uh, one person in even within their uh, all-knowing ability of you know understanding and making perfect sense of what the market is all about will still not be able to comprehend certain nuances. And the practitioner world has got to that understanding. I don't know why uh, practitioners have a uh, aversion to accepting. It could be a bit of both. It could be behavioral. It could be risk. Yeah, I think practitioners have gotten around. Sorry, it. sorry, the academic. I'm sorry. Yeah, academicians. Yes, yeah. got it. Uh, because academicians, 
won't be a cat mission if they just reported a fighting rate so you have to try and explain why that fighting exists so there's like the real life tweeting it. so the the interesting yeah. things always get the engagement so yeah. to speak yeah and you know in uh, very funny i was reading some linkedin post or twitter tweet somewhere where you know someone was crediting daniel kahneman's work saying you know this is all hogwash and i don't consider this person to be a scientist or whatever right now the point is you know you can have that adverse view about uh, something which is a which is an elephant in the room for some people and is the reality of the world for some other people but uh, ignoring you know years of evidence across various fields across the uh, various different contexts just because you have a hardliner view or you have a you know uh, let me say uh, uh, you know belicos kind of view right, with respect right. to uh, the only way of life or the only way in markets or the only way in everything is the way that i know so i think that is where the problem starts uh, unfortunately i don't see it getting fixed anytime soon <laughs> but uh, i think people have learned to coexist and move on and take the good and ignore the bad it's it's interesting that you mention the carbon thing because this is this is like a outgrowth of this entire uh, debate about replication crisis in both finance social sciences so to speak uh, yeah. i mean i'm not an academic by any stretch of nor am i a practitioner but in my own view i think uh, these debates are at the very least they are proof that for example it's like that whole uh, uh, metaphor about wildfire so they they burn away the underbrush so that you know it becomes less risky so this debates in a way clear about all the nonsense so that yeah. people actually get to focusing on something which is substantial uh, yeah, it makes it uh, uh, you know it, it makes it it makes life more productive rather than bickering about pointless things yeah. like you mentioned um, okay. so i mean that was thank, thank you for setting the context uh, today we are going to uh, start off with the og factor uh, value investing it's probably the most used term in 95% of twitter bios uh, even if you just check out 18 18 to 20 twitter accounts everybody seems to value investing i don't know what i'm missing in life so what what when we say value investing what are we talking about and how is it different from how is value as a factor different from value investing which most people talk about and also it's associated with of course mr warren buffett and you know benjamin graham so to speak so what are we talking about let's start with uh, like can you help us set the contrast between those two terms sure so value investing for a factor investor uh, is trying to understand you know which are the companies which are undervalued with respect to some intrinsic number got it uh, and hence going or allocating to those companies or uh, those assets uh, which give you that sense of undervaluation with respect to that intrinsic number and if you extend it to some further extent also going short or selling those com- companies or assets which may be overvalued with respect to that uh, some intrinsic measure right now i'll just use examples uh, for clarity does it mean this is the only way one can define it but uh, if you were to use something like price to earnings your intrinsic value is earnings right earnings is something which a company has actually derived uh, price is something which is a derivative of what market participants believe that earnings should be worth over a period of time right that's how the price to earnings multiple is figured out now if you in the most in the simplest most direct way of kind of uh, uh you know evaluating or creating this value factor as a factor investor you would try and identify companies which rank the best or rank the highest in terms of uh price with respect to earnings meaning they are the cheapest companies with respect to how much they are earning and as a corollary you will end up selling those companies which have the uh highest or the most expensive a uh, price or valuation but for market capitalization compared to how much earning they make now this is uh, this is the factor investing view of uh, what value investing is all about the uh, you know more discretionary let me use that term yeah. or you know more traditional usage of the term value investing is not drastically different okay. it is also trying to buy something which has an intrinsic Uh, valuation which is higher or relatively attractive so uh, compared to what it is currently trading for so if you think that 
company A is going to be worth $100 million, whereas it is trading for $80 million. If your hypothesis is correct over whatever time frame, uh, you end up making that $20 million because you invested when it was 80 and it re-rated or corrected to 100, right? The primary difference comes in, what do you mean by the intrinsic value of a company or an intrinsic number that you want to look at? For a factor investor, it's simple. It's mostly backward looking data. Seldom do factor investors use forward data right. because forward data for the lack of a better word is unreliable if I have the best forward estimates. The best forward estimates are, you know, it's a, I, I don't know if we spoke about it the last time, but analyst estimates, people consider analyst estimates to be a good barometer. Right. Maybe in some sense they are, but on average, 70% of your estimates are inaccurate. Right. Now, uh, you, you often hear headlines saying 70% of the company beat analyst estimates. <laughs> Does it not mean that those 70% analysts are wrong? I would think, right? So, uh, and I don't begrudge them that wrong, uh, whatever they're doing. Because, you know, they serve a purpose in the world, which is to, uh, you know, get a reality grip over what is actually happening happening in the company by doing channel checks, etc. Right. And they have the volumes to be able to do that. And hence, they set context to things. And when companies actually end up surprising, they only realize that they were not able to capture 100% of the growth or whatever, right? Uh, now, uh, taking that as gospel and taking those estimates as gospel, not just for one quarter, but forward for the next 10 to, you know, 50 to 100 to whatever number of years, and then projecting them back to a current number is not very easy. Right. There are market sense. phenomenon, but yeah. Sorry, yeah. So, the thing is then that... Uh, a value investor or the more traditionally oriented value investor has to has a lot of variability. The first variability is what is your forecasted cash flows or forecasted earnings numbers going to look like. Uh, you Not only do you have to estimate it for the next quarter, you have to estimate it way long out into the future. Right. right? The second is you also have to discount that back to your current rate. Now, someone who became a value investor in 2021 or 2020 would have thought that uh, long-term rates are never going to go up above zero percent. Yeah, it, right? it was and shocking we how all... confident we were that <laughs> this Absolutely. is the state of the world. Yeah, in hindsight, it it seems so silly, right? <laughs> but uh, there were you know serious commentators talking about uh, you know lower for uh, longer, <laughs> lower for longer, exactly. Yeah. Rates never turning positive in certain economies when they you know some I think Switzerland or someone issued yeah. like a hundred-year paper at you know, negative yield or whatever. And negative mortgages, so and so. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, uh, there is insane amount of recency bias when it comes to discounting using interest rates. And you are discounting not just for the next two years or five years. Uh, this is a common refrain I have heard. Unfortunately, I am not, I have never been a practitioner in the discretionary side of things. So, I have not actually got my hands dirty with, but right. you know, when you, when you undergo certain kind of education, you always done it at least once or twice. <laughs> and hence you, maybe at that time you didn't realize the pitfalls in this approach, but you know, over time you kind of uh, understand or sense it. The significant component of uh, the present valuation of a particular company comes from the terminal value, which is essentially saying this company is going to exist until perpetuity. And what is the current value of that perpetual yes. uh, revenue generating stream? Right, or profit or cash flow generating stream. So uh, I think it becomes hazy beyond a point. I don't think anyone. Uh, so this is like a gross oversimplification of uh, what a traditional value investor would do. Value investor would do uh, many times more work with respect to, you know, they're not focusing so much on the actual estimated value of a particular company, but trying to gain some kind of common sense idea with respect to, uh, let me say, common sense is not a uh, you know, I don't want to use that word lightly. I don't mean, you know, it's very easy and everyone can do it. But far from that. But, uh, you know, they try to get a more realistic uh, extrapolation of the valuation of a company. And they have to align it to a time horizon. Because a company can be worth 100 billion, 100 million, whatever. But the realization can happen maybe 10 years later. Right. 
would you have the willingness to hold on to that company for that long and is that return sufficient over the 10 year time got it right so uh, i think from a pure trading perspective right they are fairly different in the sense that uh, a factor investor is unemotional with respect to their buying decisions and their selling decisions so a company which looked attractive today but in couple of quarters time see this to be attractive because some other company is more attractive not because anything substantial has changed in this company can still be sold whereas a discretionary investor who is a more traditional and conventional value investor is not going to change their decision and then their portfolios are going to look similar for a longer period of time got it i don't know this if this meta- metaphor is accurate it, it kind of seems like because in the market you're actually grappling in the dark because you've no idea what happens so there are two ways two ways people are grappling with the exact same thing and they might end up in the same place a lot of uh, times yeah uh, yeah there tends to be common overlap with the stocks in both let's say a factor approach to value versus discretionary approach yeah. uh and also it's it's I, i don't know at some level becomes one of those meaning meaningless distinct, distinctions the more you uh, take yeah, to drive absolutely um uh but alluding to the earlier point you made about why a factor works it could be behavioral or risk based what's your best guess as to why value works because it's also one of the factors i wouldn't i don't want to say factor it's also one of a style that has the longest uh, acad- uh, uh, longest discussions or rather longest evidence yeah. so to speak thanks to intelligent investors so on and so forth what's your yeah. best guess about why it works Uh, I think the first reason is the easiest to explain, which is uh, you know something is truly worth more than what you uh, paid for. Right. Then over a period of time, the collective wisdom converges to what the true worth of that company should be. And if you do it uh, over a portfolio rather than at a single company, then uh, any company specific risk kind of goes out. So of course there would be these risks of bankruptcy happening all the time, but some of that get diversified away by companies which actually relate to the true potential, and hence uh, you kind of benefit because of a change in the multiple of that particular company, right? Uh, it this is the more the risk based explanation for why this works is that you know there is a clear risk that you will end up with a basket of companies which tend to be capital intensive uh that's one easy way to kind of increase your so let's say you're looking at price to book right capital intensive industries by definition have a larger base so the b is very right. large as compared to the p and hence by definition they tend to be uh you know lesser or more attractively valued uh but large capital intensive industries are also very clunky in in the event of a downturn uh when you need to be really nimble there's not really much that you can do with a very well established entrenched company right so they tend to bear the brunt of that the most so you the risk is that you will face uh you know steeper drawdowns the risk of obsolescence is very high so you may be heavily invested in a technology which needs lot of physical equipment getting procured etc suddenly there is a new technology and the old economy kind of goes away overnight uh, what do you do you you are end up, you end up with a holding in a company which is practically worth zero right so that is a real risk right. now uh, if one company in your entire portfolio faces that sure no, not a big deal but uh of course it's a big deal but at least you would hope to diversify that but if it's you know 30% of a portfolio which can happen because an a whole industry can get overhauled right? right 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 so that is that is clearly a risk associated so if there is a risk that you're taking in buying some of these clunky companies or whatever yeah uh then you need to be compensated for it the compensation is the value premium that's for next generation the other explanation which is more behavioral is that some of these companies while they are duds is the consensus uh they tend to be beaten down more than what they should be beaten down or reaction yeah so the over reaction and which is the classic uh, uh sigabert approach right. which uh, ben graham proposed also which is you know there is the last puff that is remaining <laughs> uh in the cigarette so why not uh, puff it out right. and then throw it away rather than throw it discarding it beforehand Correct. so that's the behavioral angle or behavioral explanation for the value factor i think reality is better both right. uh 
it's it's not either or again uh, but yeah that's my sense. Uh, I mean, we spoke about at length last time also. When it comes to these factors, there's hundred ways to heaven. Uh, I think it seems to be the case with uh, value also. Uh, in in your uh, in your own observations, in your own research, etc. Like uh, this single metric uh, approach to measuring value. Let's say the common one is price to book versus ensembles sure. where you combine multiple metrics. So, what do we know about what's the uh, a high probability approach to success in value, if I may, rather than binary terms of what works, what doesn't. What do we? What yeah. does the evidence say? What's your own research say about it? So I am a believer of the fact that uh, you know one definition being superior over the other would just be a vestige of data. Right. Uh, how the data has been in a particular market regime or a particular set of you know time frame. Of course, if you use ten indicators. There is going to be an ordinal ranking of those 10 indicators. Does it mean that you had a prior before looking at the data that uh, you know price to book is going to be number one and earning, uh, enterprise value to beta is going to be number two or whatever? It's only exposed or ex ante even that once you've looked at the data that you figure out that you know this is the ranking and hence let me choose one over the other. So clearly, <coughs> the hypothesis is. Uh, Lot, I would say, because there is there wasn't a hypothesis to begin with. Right. If there wasn't a hypothesis to begin with, then why curtail yourself to use, using you know a subset of the definitions? Use as many definitions as possible. Of course, that doesn't mean some definitions can't be improved upon. For example, uh, the classic price to earning effect. Now, there's been a long-standing debate that your R and D expenditure is expensed because of our accounting treatment. Or your advertising budget uh, and all those things are expensed. Right. Whereas the impact maybe plays out over a period of time. So a company which is high on R and D this year may suddenly show you very low earnings numbers, and because it shows you low earnings numbers, it may actually look to be very highly overvalued. Right, right, right. Right. Whereas is that really the case? What is the fix to it? The fix to it is. Mechanically, maybe you can do it. You can add back the R&D expense and just create an expense schedule for those. Uh, or your general expenditure, out of that, you create an expense schedule for your marketing rather than expensing all in one loop and thing. Uh, but it's not a science. It's a, it's an art, I would say, to actually be able to figure out. And uh, the same logic may not apply to every single industry and every single company. And that start getting into murky territory, especially for a factor investor. Right. Because factor investor skill is honestly not that, right? right. As a factor investor, if I try to do what a discretionary investor is doing, which is deep work in a particular company or a particular sector, uh, I'll, of course, fall behind because I have not spent as many hours working on something like this that they have spent not hours but decades on, right? So. Uh, a broad brushstroke to kind of uh, smudge over or you know gloss over all those points is perhaps not the best solution. And hence, your reliance on a particular indicator to be the best should go down even further. Got it. So you try to diversify it across a set of indicators. Some of those indicators may be corrupted because of data discrepancies, changing market order, etc. Some of those may not be. So the same in the same way, price to book. Is, not, is uncorrupted by RET expenditure, for example, right? because it's your book value and it's your price. That's it. So uh, maybe price to sales is a better metric, but sales is not relevant to financial services. So there are no one indicator is perfect, and hence it makes all the more logic to kind of. And there's someone who, so I think O'Shaughnessy, right, right, right. Patrick O'Shaughnessy, yeah. uh, O'Sam Asset Management, or Stoyle, now they are, I think, Canvas or something. <laughs> Uh, they had written a paper where they compared on a year-on-year -year basis. And they said there's no predictability that the one that you choose uh, as the highest uh, Kager generator over the entire time frame is going to be the best one year-on-year. -year. Right, right, right. In fact, it could be the worst one also in a particular year, which is to be expected because it is at the end of the day, that difference is random, is my sense. So if it is random, then why really choose to optimize there rather, you know, Focus your energies on something else and spread it out across. Take smaller bets. Uh, diversification in factor yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. metrics also. Got it. Uh, in I mean uh, the 
the other question i have two questions actually so I'll, i want to go back to earlier something which you said uh, yeah. the inherent riskiness of value because you are potentially overweighting on let's say riskier companies or companies are, that are at the risk of going obsolete so on and so forth in the last uh, i want to say 5 6 years there's this entire debate whether is value really like is value investing dead uh, mm. the simple i mean there are a lot of reasons two come to mind uh, today everybody has more access to data than anybody else everybody has a bloomberg terminal ish or some version of it so which means if everybody is working on the same set of companies trying to uh, quote and quote search for value is mm-hmm. does value really exist and the second thing which you also alluded to in terms of uh, the accounting treatment there's this entire debate about intangibles uh, a lot of today's new age companies will never seem uh, value ish on any metrics because they don't really have those old school a large balance sheet in terms of tangibles so yeah. uh, what's your sense of whether i mean it's 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 really a speculative question more than anything else like yeah. is yeah. value investing dead um at least if you if you were an investor in the last two years you would say it is not dead if <laughs> anything it is thriving right but if you were an investor for the last 12 years you would say theek hai nothing right this is me because the amount of hurt it has cost an investor for the uh, 10 years before the last two years right. uh the last two years don't come to come close to compensating that right, right, right. so but this is nothing new for value in fact value even in the us where you have data going back to 1923 or something maybe even longer but at least the one that i saw goes back to 1923 there have been at least three other cycles right. of 10 plus years of value underperforming which I, I don't recall the exact dates when it happened, but it kind of coincides with general intuition that you know your world is evolving. Right. Uh, as your world evolves, there will be certain set of companies which, or set of industries, or certain sectors which, on the whole, become laggards, and uh, the strategy you know systematically selects some of those, and hence uh, continues to do badly. Uh, but it also does come back up. uh maybe the portfolio marginally changes maybe right. some of those duds continue to exist but there are also some hidden gems in this whole uh, you know uh, picture and you know with a strategy where there is a 10 year underperformance versus versus the benchmark the behavioral explanation is very easy to kind of contextualize and internalize that if for 10 year something is underperforming like 90% of the investors have already left you right uh 90 and uh you know closely exaggerating and saying 10% will be left i don't think even 1% will be left right which essentially uh, makes the ground extremely fertile for that growth to really come about so i don't think value as a factor will ever die out completely uh but will there be temporary dislocation absolutely there is no question about it uh will there be times when it is rendered useless uh, i'm sure uh you know uh in the roaring 60s let me say right uh when you know uh, industrial production and let's say uh, or you know those maybe auto was a booming industry at that point in time uh people would have uh, you know said ki autos are the future and hence uh, you know companies which were selling station wagons uh you know horse wagons and all those things that is value this is crap now they never going to come back so value investing is going to be dead i'm sure people would have said that and now the same companies which were considered at growth are now value because your value portfolio at least in the developed world is going to be comprised of your autos right. because uh, you have nice. your ev manufacturers yeah. taking up the growth spot right so i think it just coincides with cycles in the economy uh, cycles in any country's lifespan uh, but yeah that doesn't render it useless in my mind it reminds me of the 2000 example i think uh, aqr cliff fastness was saying like right when everybody had thrown in the towel at the peak of you know the dot com exuberance like yeah. value rolled back and it was probably one of the best performing factors until 2000 uh, 5 6 7 8 uh, whatever yeah absolutely so i think uh, cliff fastness uh, could definitely attribute a lot of his success to his unwavering faith in value right 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 uh, and you know you have to give it to him because uh, you know of course he started at for as a nadir of value and you know he got a good never a worst time investor. to be a value investor <laughs> there never a worst time to be a value investor and he started with i guess billion dollars right, or something right. so it's not a uh, small change also and uh, because of his conviction he was able to write that 
uh, he stuck through value in 2019-2020. He got Roger and stuck through it. Right. And in fact, he went so far ahead as to say, uh, in general, he doesn't like to get too cute with factors. Ah, uh, right. right. Uh, but if you want to sin, there's perhaps sin never been a better time. So sin and sin. Right. right. So, of course, then the problem is, you know, for uh, people who look at success stories based on headlines, <laughs> uh, you would like to think that they have made their whole fortunes by just betting on that one value factor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oftentimes, there's a lot of subtlety. It doesn't mean that they're not diversifying themselves from low, getting blown out. So if a retail person tries to replicate what Cliff Assets did, they would perhaps get bankrupted multiple times before. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it's easy to you know get swayed away by these headlines, yeah, but yeah. the reality is their process is much more important than their individual bets with respect to factors, etc., which will not allow them to take outside bets in anything. In any case, and with a with a manager of the size of AQR, which is 150 billion or more, uh, you can't uh, you know take these kind of random one-sided bets and you know hope that things will turn out in your favor. That nobody get nobody get paid to do that. You know that's that's like buying a lottery ticket. Right? So uh, anyway, so uh, that doesn't mean he of course has faith in it, but he also has good risk management in place to make sure it doesn't blow up if you know his bet doesn't go right. That's also, the most also important thing. Enormously evidence oriented in terms of how they go back and revisit their own prior see if they've gone some uh, they've gone wrong somewhere or if they are just holding yeah, on to the absolutely. wrong bets so on so to speak. Absolutely. Uh, also it's it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, it's it's paying by the headlines. It reminds me of this uh, Morgan Housel's quote saying, Know what games you are playing. Like you can't emulate Warren Buffett be, uh, just by thinking that you'll pick undervalued companies, quote unquote, and Absolutely. become rich. He's playing a different Absolutely. game, whereas access to different. To, he's playing on a different level. If you are a retail investor, Absolutely. you you should you should know where you stand and what you do. And it's not uh, absolutely makes absolutely. sense. Uh, Controversial question in the sleepy world of fact investing in 2015, there's an entire stir when uh, professors Farmer and friends said value investing is irrelevant. It was context oriented, of course, uh, when their uh, three factor model became uh, four factor, sorry, five factor model. Five factor. Um, and there was a there's a ton of debate. I think the Robeco guys, they wrote a paper saying that a lot of whatever the professors had written was, uh, had a lot of holes. Uh, uh, let me put it that way. And also, uh, other research came out saying that the two new factors, profitability and uh, investment, explained a lot of values, uh, explanatory power, so to speak. And then, of yeah. course, the AQR guys published a paper saying that it depends on how you are measuring value, so, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, again, it, it's, a, it's, it's a different way of asking the same question I asked about whether value investing is dead. So, similar question is value a real factor or are we all deluding ourselves? Uh, I... Yeah, it's a very interesting, thought-provoking question because I've considered this multiple times. Right. And if you were an Indian investor during that whole time frame, right, you would uh, have been pretty okay if you agreed with the hypothesis that value missing is dead right. that whole decade. <laughs> the US can get away with saying that uh, 2010 to 2020 was a growth decade for them. And hence you had the fangs and all those companies really hitting it out of the park. Right. What about India? India didn't have any fang fang equivalent. We still don't have a fang equivalent. Maybe you know Zomato, one of those companies. But uh, you know, broadly speaking, and they have very short histories of getting listed. So why did value as a strategy not work in India? It was, by the way, not a great decade for Indian investors in any which way. Uh, but why did uh, it, does, it, did, it did not work in India? Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, saying that a strategy or a factor, of course, when, uh, you know, if someone like someone of the caliber of uh, Eugene Pharma says something, it's, he doesn't say it lightly and you've got to take it seriously. But, uh, of course, it is contextual and maybe what he is referring to is the fact that, A, there are maybe different ways to Maybe it's a different manifestation when you kind of, uh, you know, invest in a company which is uh, more aggressive versus more conservative. Uh, so the whole investment factor, uh, I think that subsumes value is what they were trying to say. Uh, maybe that's one way to measure it is what I could think. Uh, and there is also some research, I think, uh, uh, 
uh, Beth Gray and the people at Alpha Architect, I think they put out saying you can revive it if you start measuring it in small cap space. Right. And uh, Cliff, which uh, Cliff and his team put out the paper on the devil in uh, HML details, oh, right. exactly. uh, which basically says, uh, you know, instead of using lagged values for your price as well as for your earnings, use more timely values. Suddenly you start seeing that it can be revived and it start becoming a different factor, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I think it comes to that practitioner nuance as to how they want to use it. Uh, you don't want to uh, leave money lying on the table because, of course, there is a segment of the market which is uh, uh, I either bought on to it or completely ignored it. Either way you look at it. So I, I would say that it is. I, I, I don't know now. Is it a risk based factor? Is it a uh, behavioral factor? Is it mix of both? Maybe it is a mix of both. Uh, is it a real factor or not? I think it is a real factor. Maybe there are better ways to measure it. Maybe some of that significance, statistic, uh, explanatory power goes down if you uh, include it in a broader setting as compared to if you were to specify where you want to play out value. Uh, and once you kind of uh, you know tighten your screws around where is it that you really want to be playing it, uh, I think it revives itself and it kind of uh, makes co continues to make sense because see it's for an investor, personally, I think that this is the easiest thing to convince yourself of, right? That, you know, something is, you know, let's say you are uh, trading a multi-factor portfolio and, you know, everything else is kind of checked out. There's no good reason to say there's a company, there are two companies, one is high momentum, high profitability, both of them are, but one is available for cheaper than the other. Would you deliberately buy the more expensive one? Would, right? sense, yeah. would buy the more the cheaper one right so it's it's easy to kind of also explain intuitively to oneself as to why one would want to do it and i think in the entire gamut of factor based investing value and to some extent some smattering size uh, are the two factors which lend themselves easily to be explained intuitively also with uh, in addition to behavioral and its based explanations as compared to the other factors where there is a it's, it's more difficult to wrap your head around it. So I don't want to go against collective human intuition also uh, over a long period of time. So uh, I just want to pick up on one thing you alluded to. So it, it, it all boils down to how you measure it or rather in the sense that measurements really matter when it comes to factors when you're talking. Naturally, that leads to the question, is, is this entire thing a mirage of data, you know, like uh, data hacking? Is this all... Is it, no such thing as factors. This is this is this is the common argument that a lot of factor detractors, so to speak, uh, pick up on. Yeah, I think it is definitely uh, uh, a serious problem. P hacking is a serious problem, uh, which is you test hundreds of variations, and uh, you know some of those variations will have a statistically significant uh, p score, and hence you or these stat. And hence you kind of pick up those and publish data saying that and then you reverse fit your explanation and everything else. That is a serious problem, no question about it. I just feel that for some of these factors, at least broadly speaking, uh, some of them you know actually very interesting that you know most of the data centers around you know the uh, time period that farm of is used it. In most markets, it is 1950 and beyond and so on. Right. There have actually been people who gone further back, beyond 1922, maybe mid to late 1800s, and have 30, 40 years of data, which they call now out of sample, because that's not data which is used to uh, calculate the key stats or the P scores for the uh, data that is published, right. and test out on that, and have actually found statistical significance in those. Uh, which has given people confidence and a lot of these papers once you publish them uh, are the alphas completely falling off a cliff as soon as it becomes public or not and if it is as soon as it is if, if it is happening that way that as soon as it is published it is falling off a cliff uh, then it means that maybe it even existed but then it is so fleeting that it kind of got diversified away uh, you know maybe then the explanation doesn't hold merit or whatever, but people ignore something like that. But for some of these factors, I think exposed data is also reasonably promising. So the simplest Hawkins razor, if you kind of use uh, as your guiding, uh, guiding light, and you kind of 
uh, say that the simplest explanation if something has worked in the past when you didn't have the data and is working so after you have published a particular paper uh, despite there being real life impact at least in the present then you despite rather than trying to say no even here there is some data mining or whatever is some problem <laughs> you go with the easier explanation which is maybe there is some merit to it it reminds me of that uh, uh, larry swedros five rules uh, i forget the five rules it said yeah. one was economic intuition there should yeah. be uh, yeah. empirical evidence so on i yeah. think I, i'll add the links in the description apart from all the geeky uh, literature yeah. that you referenced as well uh, but yeah I, I, it completely makes sense but uh, going back to the earlier point which you mentioned which was interesting said uh, that 2006 to call it 2008 period where indian fa- uh, value so, uh, so to speak was having a bad period uh, in general what what do we know about how value works well in the indian context because um, of two important distinctions one of course uh, us is not india at the broader level the if you go check the top 10 or 15 uh, holdings of s&p 500 it's all new age companies uh, and like you mentioned indian uh, indices are dominated by old economy stocks sure. uh, what do we know about values uh, uh, does it does it work in india what what is the evidence say have you looked at it yeah in the indian context i think Uh, now after uh, more than i think 17 years of live data i think since inception now value has started doing delivering positive alpha versus uh, the broader market uh, in publicly available indices oh nice <laughs> you talk about s&p uh, bsc s&p uh, index i think nifty doesn't have a comparable index because nifty see the problem is Uh, with some of these indices is also that you know they are not they lend, don't lend themselves very easily for comparison so some someone is applying it on the top 200 unit you know, stocks the other is applying it on the top 500 stock and your uh, market capitalization profile is completely different to each other right. uh, you can't really compare the two strategies and say one is better than the other or whatever but at least for the s&p one which applies it on a large mid space right uh, even there uh, the value factor is now since inception Uh, since the inception of that index, I think 2005 or so, right. it now demo- delivers or uh, has demonstrated a positive alpha. It was not the case maybe a couple of years ago when we, uh, I was looking at the data more closely, where it yeah. was uh, lagging even on a 15-year basis. Uh, I don't know that India also had a factor winter, so to sp- sorry, value winter, so to speak. Yeah, India definitely had a value winter. So India had a So, if you go back, if you want slightly longer data in Indian context, uh, <clears throat> I am I am Ahmedabad actually publishes uh, data for some of these factors. They are Professor the more, Varma's library. Yeah, yeah, and uh, this uh, this uh, he is now a professor, a visiting faculty at uh, I am Ahmedabad called Rajan Raju. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he the uh, so he is doing great work on factor research, and you know he is. Uh, doing it as a human service i would say because uh, you know he, he doesn't need to do it he's had a right, right. great career and this is i think what he's doing in his entire life uh, which is uh, you know creating those time series actually in some cases even uh, guiding the am amdavad the professors as well as students so managing that to kind of make it better how can it be made more interpretable etc etc and his own website has some of this information so if you go back to that history then of course there is alpha that is generated but that also takes into account a lot longer period than 2005 and some of these that they started uh, value factor i think fell a lot in subtract uh, then subsequently in all the other crashes it has fallen a lot it has also gone up in bull period so i think 14 17 were great periods for value 18 was terrible 18 19 both terrible <laughs> Uh, and hence, I think as a cumulative impact, it was lagging right. uh, until the last two years, 2021, 22, 23, have been absolutely fabulous for the strategy. Uh, now, uh, I have unfortunately not looked at the sector profiles, etc., right. on a going back basis to see if they have drastically changed. I would think they would have drastically changed also because a lot of the companies which were value earlier are value now. They continue to be value even with a huge run up. Correct. Right. But uh, and I also don't know what what was the trigger that take people to completely start picking up value. Maybe it was global inflation. Uh, maybe 
I don't know if it was value was ever going to be a beneficiary of rising rates. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, if you're talking about a capital int- intensive industry and that industry is going to finance its, uh, you know, capital intensive purchases through borrowing and suddenly your cost of borrowing goes up. Is that going to necessarily be a positive for some of these companies? I don't think so. So intuition kind of beats that. But, uh, you know, never have, nevertheless, 2022 was a banner year for value world over. Uh, and I, I think largely, at least in the initial part, due to rising energy prices, etc., uh, a lot of these companies tended to fall in those sectors. Right. And I think in general, bank and financial services also tend to be uh, value companies uh, in most definitions. And right. uh, with uh, rising, I think uh, transmission becomes slower when you uh, on the deposit side as opposed to on the uh, lending on their side. lending side or their, so basically they, that increases that name or whatever Limits, it is yeah. that they have so as a result maybe uh, both of these industries which are larger representations in the value factor benefited and hence we uh, had decent tailwind going on for that factor uh, honestly very difficult to put a timeline as to for how long it will last uh, I would just say enjoy the ride <laughs> <laughs> rather than trying to get too cute around it because you know you, you may end up uh, getting out of the factor, you, you know, you could have actually, if you were a timing man, you would have gotten out of the factor in 2023 January. Yeah. And this year again, that strategy is uh, absolutely eroded to everyone else. So it reminds me of that again, not to keep quoting Cliff Asness, but hold on to it like grim death. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorite investing quotes. Ever. But, but the, uh, the interesting point you made about the universe uh, of stocks that you're using to define value, so to speak. Do we know anything about uh, value in, let's say, large, mid versus small? Like, where does it show up? The US evidence, if I remember correctly, says that value in large caps at least is not as large as uh, most people assume. And it tends to keep going up, uh, or rather the premium tends to go up if you go down the market cap uh, quartiles or deciles. Yeah, at least seems to be the case. You know, the common uh, arguments that you make for smaller cap investing Right. Which could be that it, there's an illiquidity premium that uh, it, the, the company that list is covered and hence not as easily accessible. So those you are adding on to those uh, arguments by saying now we also are looking at companies which also check all those other criteria but are also undervalued compared to the others. Right. So I think the size premium is combining with the value premium and hence I would think that the overall oh. premium for the factor would go up as compared to uh, in a larger. I think. Intuitively, that that so it should be also. Uh, is it statistically significant the difference to control for the size effect? I have my doubts because right. ultimately it, it shouldn't be that way. If it is that way, then we are missing something. That there is some other interaction which is happening between value and size, which is not really apparent. I I would have my doubts on that. Got it. I'm going to put you in the hotspot, so to speak, again and ask you, is the size effect real? Because, uh, I mean, the, again, the AQR guys had put out a paper saying that it doesn't exist. The, if I remember correctly, our own, uh, the IM, Ahmedabad's uh, library also shows that the size premium in India seem, doesn't seem to exist. Is Was that also a stat, uh, statistical artifact, so to speak, or uh, you fall on the other side of the spectrum? Um, it's, it's actually, in India especially, it's very hard to argue against uh, the size factor right. uh, because uh, of overwhelming data on at least the mid cap segment doing right. uh, so there you know a lot of this models which model mid cap separately rather than clubbing them into just two different uh, classifications which is large and small right. uh, they also kind of try to treat mid cap and use that as a slightly different manifestation of size uh, because maybe because they behave differently is the intuition right. Uh, but it's very hard to argue against uh, the size factor in India given the performance of some of these strategies on a risk adjusted basis also, especially the mid-cap space. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, of course, we kept uh, on the discretionary side, we keep hearing that, you know, on the mid and small cap segment, you still have a uh, reasonable alpha that is getting generated as compared, as compared to on the large cap side. Uh, but And that is very heartening to hear because uh, on one hand, the mid-cap segment itself has uh, at least demonstrated uh, sizable outperformance versus the large cap. I don't know for how long it is going to last, but at okay. least it's uh, for now it is showing that on a risk-adjusted basis. So risk neutrally, 
the mid cap segment looks better and if there is some stock selection on that space which is doing even better right which if you argue that uh, you know uh, that some of that at least can be captured through factors right uh, then it lends itself to a very uh, conducive and fertile hunting ground for fact investors also that day on one hand you already have mid cap space being reasonably more fertile uh and on the other hand fact there is some alpha generation which is being demonstrated so maybe factors will harness some of that and hence your overall alpha maybe looks better as compared to the large cap it's uh, so i uh, i am not fully on the cap of size factor not existing at least in india right. now whether it is an artifact of data i don't know because you know in the grander scheme of things the 15 years or 20 years of data which we have is nothing Right, right, right. So, right. It, so to statistically say that you know size factor is gone, maybe we need fifty years of data. Yeah, so till we going get back there, to the same yeah. uh, argument about whether value premium is diminished. Exactly. Give it time. <laughs> exactly. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, I think I think one of the arguments with size was. Uh, uh if i'm remembering my reading correctly when people said that when uh, because most of this factor tests are on that ken french data library and there apparently there were some adjustment issues in terms of survive, sur- survivorship bias etc which is why when you control for that at least the size premium seemed to vanish and i mean at least the people who claim that the premium doesn't exist at least in the us context are so far looking well considering that uh, from the late uh, from the early 2000s at least it's it's gone nowhere yeah, yeah i mean yeah. like you said it's it's just one observation one roll of the dice yeah. to uh, give it more got it uh, now to the more nebulous factor quality because even i i'm on i'll be honest some if somebody comes and ex- asks me to explain i have a tough time explaining what quality is because the definitions range across yeah. the spectrum just yeah. like everybody is a value investor everybody is a quality at reasonable price investor correct uh, absolutely so if, if in the simplest term possible uh, how would you define quality and uh, yeah so uh, you know definition i would like to set some context for where this quality factor came from right which i read from uh, not read from but i think one of the guys who do the best job in uh, explaining the quality factor i felt where right. you are got it so what they did or what they said is you know you have this gordon growth model right you scale it for book value so that you, all the companies are comparable uh the gordon growth model basically predicts the historical price or the current price of company based on whatever prediction you want to make it Right. and they started with a hypothesis that if the company is touted to be high quality then its price scaled for book value which is nothing but your price to book should be a high number this i think we all would agree on right that uh, uh, a high quality company should typically command a higher valuation compared to a low quality company. Right. and now i'm not talking about the quality factor or anything i'm just right, saying right, right, right. a high quality company we think about you know asian paints or whatever uh, it's at a versus, premium yeah it, it tends to trade at a higher valuation for various reasons right it right. grows at a faster rate it uh, returns your money at a faster rate at a higher rate it has exhibits higher margins and it's able to consistently do so over a period of time right, right. that's that's why i think we command they command a higher price movement now so they basically broke down the gordon growth model and they basically rearranged terms in such a manner that the valuation of the company started becoming a function of your profitability growth and profitability and became a function of your safety which is how much leverage you've taken etc and it became a function of payout which is uh, you know how much you are returning to investors versus how much you are retaining and then reinvest right uh, so linear like linearly dependent on them now if you were to believe that a high quality company should truly have a high price then a simple regression of this left uh, side of the equation with the four right hand variables should yield you a regression output which explains some 70 80% of the variation in the price right which essentially means it's a good model what the data was observed was that if you run this regression instead of that 70 80% number depending on how you measure it sometimes the explanatory power for the valuation is only to the tune of 20% wow 
which essentially means that despite having all these great characteristics <laughs> it is not truly priced right and if something is not truly priced then it has a potential to give you returns right right, right. so uh, because at some point in time someone will realize that you know this is the true price so the genesis of the quality factor came from the fact that the positive quality attributes of a company were not able to fully explain the price of a company and not even partially abysmally low number of explanatory power and hence there was significant scope for something else which was unexplained which was not completely reflecting in the price if it is not reflecting in the price correctly but subsequently it has to be realized because this you know just arithmetic then the return that you generate are going to be higher and that was the genesis of the quality premium got it now if you want to tweak it around and say okay this is a artifact of the data like you say but is it then you have to see okay it could either be data mine which is possible this is some random observation that is could be a risk premia or it could be a behavioral kind of uh, phenomenon right now data mining is a difficult argument to defend especially with this factor because you know you define fact, the factor in various ways right. create an ensemble it doesn't matter really because various definitions have created you know positive outcomes right. and historically so over long enough you know, time frames etc wherever it is measurable you see it you can talk about it as a risk based explanation but in times of crisis you actually see the opposite behavior right in times of crisis unlike for the value factor where you see exodus out of those companies and hence cheaper fall in you see exod entry into quality companies right mass exodus out of markets of course you can't avoid but you uh, there's a higher probability you don't completely exit out of the paint for britannia whereas you would exit out of maybe you know uh, one of these uh, psu banks or whatever that is right, right. so there is space expansion also is not very apparent it seems as the behavioral reason maybe which is that you know which is very similar to the low volatility right uh, saying typically these tend to be lower beta companies typically these tend to be companies which are non glamorous and hence no uh, social value in holding into these companies etc uh, leverage constrained investors would want to bet on the other end of the spectrum which is the faster growth or whatever right okay. these companies tend to grow at a reasonably steady steady pace they don't grow enormously Uh, because you know it's important because <coughs> they return capital back their companies which have higher payouts because they feel that at the basis that they operate they can't sustainably grow at let's say a high or they can't sustainably return their profitability and hence the best uh, recourse for those additional funds is to return it to investors which is very different from a high growth company so to speak which will keep reinvesting and hence be very aggressive in its investment etc and low on payout as well, right so these are not interesting companies to own these are not exciting companies to own uh, you know they will underwhelm in a strong market and a lot of those behavioral aspect which you would typically associate with a low volatility factor you can also associate with here uh, and hence uh, there's a lot of similarity in performance also in fact the way aqr measures it they have this uh, sub factor within this uh, quality minus junk where there is one uh, uh sub feature which is called betting against beta right 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 low like betting against beta factor is nothing but low volatility yeah <clears throat> lower volatility lower beta lower as well right so uh from that perspective i think quality factor and low volatility factor are similar in terms of their explanation of course there are subtle differences in how they behave you know in certain market conditions low volatility factors uh at least historically been shown to not be so great or at least macroeconomic conditions where it has shown to not be so great but as uh, quality as a factor has shown to be greater or better etc so uh, i don't want to get into uh, the exact reasons for why because honestly speaking i also don't know what the <laughs> exact reasons are why because see uh, there is a lot of uh, i i don't know if we discussed this last time but there was this paper called fire and ice which is a paper by man group right which right. was and this was written back in 2021 or 2020 or something something around that time where they basically said you know uh, in high inflationary periods which are the factors that should do that uh got and it. there you could see contrasting behavior between low volatility and quality right. but the problem is 
even high inflationary periods, even in a market like the US, which has data for 100 years, there are only very few periods. So to draw statistical inference out of those and then, you know, extrapolate and say that every time in future this is going to happen is very difficult. So, uh, and we tried to replicate that study, by the way, in India, uh, okay. for, and we constructed those factors just to kind of see how they will look like. Uh, because we had publicly available data from 2005, but data existing for that also. So we constructed factors with whatever room for error there may be. Uh, and with 25, 30 years of data that we were armed with, honestly, we weren't able to uh, find consistent or similar outcomes to what the man group paper found. So, uh, which again led to my conclusion at least that with disparate events, very difficult to time factors and hence allocate very strongly. Uh, you know, especially if you don't have the intuition to support it. So, Got yeah. It. Uh, go, going back to that study, like what other interesting observations did it yield? Uh, it could be about other factors also. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, in the original paper, I think uh, they said that momentum and trend following are the best performing strategies. We found out of the few events which we had, which were high, highly inflationary, there were some periods where momentum actually did very well. But there were also periods where it was the worst performing. And if you averaged out the returns across the, which is of course not the best way to combine them because they are not events which are, right. uh, you know, spaced very closely to each other. They are very disparate events. But if you still average out, momentum still came out somewhere in the, you know, middle or closer to the bottom as compared to being closer to the top in the uh, US study. Right. Uh, low all in quality, we didn't find a divergent behavior that uh, they found. Right. Uh, of course, value, I think the behavior was comparable that, uh, right. Uh, you know, as soon as your inflationary period starts, uh, mm -hmm. your value factor typically tends to go, which is, you know, to be expected because value typically tends to comprise of those commodity producers, etc., which are direct beneficiaries of inflation. So, right. And that was the similarity, the differences there on the other factors. Got it. Uh, just to pick up on one other aspect of this, uh, I wanted to ask for, uh, ask this the same question for value also. In terms of economic environments or economic regimes, if you want to call them, like, what do we know about which factors tend to perform well? Because ultimately, I think this feeds into the whole question about how do you diversify, how do you build multi-factor portfolios? Yeah, so uh, you will know it after the fact at least that uh, quality <laughs> has tended to do well in, uh, uh, let me say, two types of economies. One is, uh, you know, very uh, perilous looking economy but that's i think a more hazy definition as compared to yeah, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know maybe align it closer to market uh, and then there are certain markets where um, quality typically has done well right. uh, but similar conditions everything else looking very similar quality has also paid so 2022 was a great example for quality not working in india right and which came because we had a lot of overhang of quality, to be very honest, uh, in going into <laughs> 2022. Every, like you said, every investor was a QARP investor. Coffee right? can. <laughs> yeah. uh, everything was that, right? right. And uh, 2022 was absolutely, you know, crushing for. Uh, and see, honestly, if you paid in 2022 because you were rolled up on quality, there's something wrong. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the factor, maybe. Right. But as an investor, and if I'm evaluating you as an investor, would I really begrudge you being long on quality? Because see, it had all the recipe to be conducive as an environment for quality. Right. right. Quality had done well previously uh, in such market conditions. The only problem was that quality was on a roaring upswing going back to maybe 2014 or maybe even before that that, uh, you know, the margin of safety that the quality factor afforded was actually completely gone. So at that point in time, it was a quality factor was like any other factor and hence fell pretty much as much. Whereas there was a lot more margin of safety, which was perhaps built into the value factor, which kind of uh, uh, waded through. And we actually, uh, to be also fair, is we while we saw these initial shoots and upticks of, you know, disturbances, uncertainty, etc., etc., there was also some encouraging news in some part of the world and right. some positive sentiment, uh, maybe some market reacting positively because of which 
collectively we fell down but we also recovered reasonably quickly and we didn't yeah. fall down by 25% in one right, right. we fell down by maybe 5 6% next month we were up we were flat or up by a you know, couple of percent points so right uh, so uh, and the margin of safety in quality was gone so quality was perhaps not the best investment to make in 2022 but <clears throat> it wouldn't have been the best investment to make in 2020 or 2021 either but it did fantastically well in those years so someone who you know and most of our you know serious uh, mutual fund management or pms management or etc has happened in the last 10 12 years so all of us yeah, are yeah. educated and guided by what has happened in the last 10 12 years yeah. so i think what happened in 2008 and 2009 is ancient memory <laughs> uh, and most people uh, want to take out that period because they treat that as an anomaly and say market yeah. has regularly changed beyond that right uh it could be true it could not be true but i think people look at it like that now because people look at it like that and uh suddenly you have this 14 15 years so it's it's like saying 2021 in hindsight it seems you should have got out of nasdaq right 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 but right. after 12 years of roaring performance in ina term it was absolutely mind boggling it was you know some 28 30% kegger would you have had the gumption to go out of it because you thought maybe one more year or maybe one draw down and i'll get down right unfortunately most people enter at pretty much close to the peak yeah, and yeah, yeah, you yeah. know they're still underwater and that story of course there but uh, you know broadly speaking i wouldn't uh, the performance of quality was fairly uncharacteristic but uh, given with the knowledge of perfect hindsight which we now have and you right. know everything we know that has transpired and we can force an explanation to fit Right, right, uh, right. this seems to be the most logical explanation back in 2022 and if 2022 repeats again by the way would you not take a quality bet i don't think so you should take a quality bet so yeah got it no, it's it's a interesting thing that you mentioned about <laughs> this so called stories yeah. um uh, of course like you mentioned for value there's a story that it typically tends to load up on old economy stocks oil stocks yeah. commodities etc which tend to rise go up in a, an inflationary environment um similar argument could be made for quality stocks because they tend to have larger pricing power let's exactly. say the asian pains of your world britannia they could uh, uh, they are they're in a good spot to pass on the price increases yeah. so like when you, when people are thinking in terms of narratives i mean this this typically never ends well it it doesn't i mean 2020 to 2023 is like the prime example of stories uh, working but uh, at yeah. least in the factor sense when people are basing their intuition based on the stories and narratives what are the pitfalls that one should look out for both as a practitioner and as an investor uh i think as a practitioner one of the biggest pitfalls to look out for is if you have data which counters your intuition there are two approaches one is you say okay my intuition is wrong and hence i don't invest second is you say my intuition is right there was an anomaly so you continue to invest and the, i think the third approach is to maybe uh, not completely fail but at the same time also not go all in because you believe that uh, you know your intuition is right and the market is wrong because uh, there will always be few data points which will not fit the regression line right absolutely uh, it could be an outlier now explanations are only useful if you know them before the fact and if you are right they are not use- they are useful to understand but not useful to predict they don't have any predictive power in if i explain something after the fact having pers- perfect hindsight right so uh, you learn more about the markets and you put it back into your kitty but don't uh, act too drastically based on that additional piece of information that's uh, that i think the number one thing to kind of think of both from a practitioner point of view and a, and honestly i would say that practitioners and investors who are uh, let me say retailers <coughs> are not all that uh, all that different right. uh, you know maybe a, a practitioner never goes all in on a single stock idea but for a broader theme practitioners can go all in right which is just a super impo- or you know an extrapolated uh, you know Uh, version of what a retail investor is doing so i don't think uh, there is a whole lot of difference there a uh, lot of people would have changed tracks would have uh, given 2022 so it's it's a time for you to course correct or let me not say course correct but it's a time for you to kind of uh, you know reevaluate if your original hypothesis is still true 
can you make modifications? And if you're making modifications, does that change your original hypothesis? And is that change warranted? You can, you know, revalue all this. But if you go from being a growth investor to a value investor, just because value had a banner year in 2022, I think that's, some people would do it, some people won't. Uh, I think the thing, the right approach, the prudent approach is to, again, uh, side your puts, side your bits. Uh, that's that's actually priceless wisdom. Uh, in, in in terms of going back to the controversial questions, what do we know about whether quality? Because there's this argument about quality being essentially profitability and maybe the investment right. factor put together in some loose sense. Uh, and also going back to the definition like you initially alluded to also, it's not really uh, very easy to tease out what exactly quality is. It also in some sense lies in the eyes of the beholder, if I may use that term. Um, in terms of its... Uh, given the evidence we have both in India and uh, in the US, like is this a real factor? So, some people may say profitability is quality. Right. And if you believe in profitability or at some level believing in quality, it's quality is a terminology. Some people, so it's like uh, profitability is not called profitability. I think it's robust finance streak or something. Yeah. Uh, that's how Palmer French uses it, right? Uh, <laughs> AQR made it popular. The, uh, acronym QMJ, which is quality minus junk. And AQR has a great way with words, right? So <laughs> their papers are the most catchy titles. Right, right. Uh, their factors are, you know, betting against Vita and things like that. So it's a, they, they're very good at that. But you have to remember that they are also practitioners and they are also in the business of, you know, attracting eyeballs, yeah. right? So they, they want all those definitions to be catchy and quality is a catchy term. But uh, robot minus week, not so much. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, and so on. So, and gross profit over assets, some people use that, GPOA, like who cares about gross profit over assets, it's just profitability, but the point is, if someone says GPOA, I think there's one paper on Pumitek, which uses GPOA, and right. uh, uh, so various definitions of quality at some level, they all tend to work, but uh, you know, or they tend to work at some cycles, etc. Uh, some people use accruals to a great extent, which is to say how much of your earnings are actually cash earnings versus how much of them are accrued. And the larger the accruals, the more risky a company tends to be, and so on. Right. So the problem with quality is not so much that it is it a factor at all. The problem is what is the correct definition for quality? Yeah, I mean, because, like I said, uh, I, I I still can't wrap my head around it. I know yeah. it sounds very so embarrassing, like, but I can't. Yeah, even if it is like you know profitability, growth and profitability, safety payout. Yeah, yeah, profitability yeah, yeah. can be measured in different ways. Growth and profitability can be again measured in ten different ways and so on. So basically, just for that one factor, which is called quality, you may end up using fifty indicators. And if you use fifty indicators, you don't know which one indicator actually contributed to your performance, right? So practitioners don't worry about it so much. Practitioners use fifty indicators and move on in life. But uh, as a more theoretically oriented person, you would want to glean more insights from individual definitions. So you never see, uh, at least I have never seen. Uh, never say never, but I think mo mostly to the best of my recollection, I have never seen any academic paper using an ensemble of definitions. To yeah, yeah, yeah. It's typically one, the, uh, one or nothing. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I was having a conversation with uh, an academician who was trying to convince me that uh, you know ROE is old world and you know gross profit over assets is the most cutting edge definition of quality, profitability. Uh, he may be right, I don't know, but will I will I allocate my entire portfolio based on that definition? Absolutely not. So that's that's the way for practitioners I think it's not that difficult. And for practitioners, actually the marketing angle of this whole thing is, you know, if you you can't ever go wrong with the quality factor, right? So you you <laughs> can be absolutely worried as the performance. Yeah. But you can say, look, this is the company I bought. You want me to sell this company and buy, you know, some no-name company which had crazy returns. And investors are not going to flee you. Because investors will give you time because they think, no, this process is right. These companies are absolutely great because they're the most marketed and most popular, etc., etc. So quality is a factor which is very really investor-friendly. <laughs> that's a great label. I, like I said, I, you, you, I think you hit it on the nail when you said nobody will get fired for buying quality yeah. because what else will you do? Uh, I, I think with, with quality, I think we've pretty much covered uh, all the ground that I uh, wanted to ask, including whether it's a real quality or not. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, just picking up on an earlier point you made about when you guys studied the Indian data, uh, you mentioned that returns were similar to low volatility. So in the sense that 
uh, the, is there nothing in terms of the difference between those factors, at least in the Indian context? There could be periodic dislocations. Right. Uh, you know, few years where one strategy did significant. 2018 comes to mind. Right. Where I think low volatility was slightly, you know, noticeably better. There could be another year where, you know, quality was noticeably better. But uh, when you take a couple of steps back and look at the data, I don't see huge discrepancies. Got it. And, and since we last spoke, has anything changed your own understanding about factors? I mean, uh, this is this is one area which is fertile for academics. It's just yeah. tons and tons of new research come keeps coming up and Absolutely. just getting barraged by it. Yeah. Has, so what has sorry has anything drastically changed your own understanding? Also, have you uh, uh, tweaked your uh, let's say the way? So you we have it's very interesting that you asked. We have made some changes in the sense that uh, you know you can have a. Uh, I've always had a view that you know if you are an active investor which is to say you have non-passive allocations. Now, there's an argument that says anything which is not market cap weighted yeah, on the entire universe is active. But I don't take that extreme of view, but I say, okay, if you are active in the terms of what factors you take exposure to, how much exposure do you take to those factors, etc., you're active in that view. Uh, you should also be very mindful of the residual exposures you have to some of the other factors. Right. which uh, you may not have a negative view on, but not necessarily a positive view on also. Classic case in point is something like a quality factor. If you are long quality, you tend to be short value uh, taking out the market. Right. So of course, in a, a long only equity portfolio, market is driving 70-60% of the returns. Uh, I'm talking about the balance, which is you know uh, value tends to opposite of what quality tends to do. Not perfectly, but significantly negatively. Uh, in your quest to express your view on quality, for example, if you are a quality minded, quality conscious investor, if you end up having a residual negative exposure to, let's say, value or let's say momentum, do you want to retain that? Do you want to uh, negate that, given that? Uh, you don't necessarily have a negative view on value, even if the quality factor has a negative value. Because they are not perfectly negatively correlated. Right? If they were perfectly negatively correlated, you can't have both. You can have only one. But if they are partially negatively correlated, then uh, do you maybe want to make sure that if you don't have a negative view on something, but a strong positive view on something else. By expressing a strong positive view, if you are unintentionally taking a negative view, do you want to utilize that or not? And the conclusion or realization we came to was that we wanted to utilize that. How do you go about that? Like you go maybe shuffle the sectors or maybe reduce this? Yeah, or so, something? yeah something like that. So there are multiple ways. So maybe you, uh, you know, if it's a plain negative market exposure that you have, you offset it by, you know, going long to that extent okay. or whatever. Uh, you can take sectoral exposures, increase or decrease the sectoral exposures, or you can, you know, uh, create a small, smaller allocation which has more purer exposure to that particular factor and okay. give it some weightage so that it kind of negates it. So that was one interesting insight for us, which was, you know, we were running some negative exposure, unintended negative exposure, in some of our factors, we, which we wanted to align, get it back to zero. Uh, so, and uh, again, this is one of those changes which, if I look at a 25 year picture and I give you the back tested data, it is incomprehensible which is which, and you know, it's very difficult to kind of really wrap your head around and say, no, this is the better idea. You know, you yeah. shouldn't express it or you should express it. But then this is completely a practitioner's take on it, right? It's like, do you want to be doing it or not? And if you don't want to be doing it, then great, we should. Definitely work around, work towards that. And if you want to, you're happy taking that negative tilt, then that's so weird. But then you also be ready to pay the consequences of it, which is, you know, when that factor works, you're negatively impacted. Got it. You mentioned correlation. So, uh, yeah. at least in the, uh, there's, there's tons of evidence on the US side, but I don't know if there's much on the Indian side apart from the you know, public available presentations of mm. fund literature, etc. What do we know about correlations in across, let's say, call it the four or five major factors? What so, What is positively correlated, what's negative? So, the correlation typically 
when you say correlation, the right way to measure it is through a long shot portfolio. Because if you measure correlations on long only portfolios where 60 70 percent is all beta, right. uh, market beta, then your correlation numbers are going to be you know a low correlated strategy. Couple of strategies are going to have a correlation of 75 percent, and high correlated strategies are going to have 95 percent. 95 and 75 don't look all that different. So, if you were to measure it on a long short basis, then value quality and low wall value tend to be negatively correlated. Quality low wall, of course, are very highly positive. Correlated. And momentum, while you know, tends to be closer to zero with both of these factors, it's very time varied. So, it's not very constant. Uh, so, there are times when it is positively correlated to momentum, and it's, uh, sorry, value, and other times when it's positively correlated to low quality and low wall. Uh, so that relationship is a bit unstable, I would say. Got it. Uh, the others are, yeah, like it's a negative. Got it. And, and considering most people tend to be long only, including uh, let's say retail investors. So what does this mean for combining uh, factors? So one example which comes to mind is most people say value and momentum tend to go well to great together. Uh, so what does this mean in the sense of like if I am putting, let's say beta is my, it's, it's a given in the sense that it is free market returns, you're taking it. Now okay. then I add something to it, which is basically masala in terms of adding other factors. So what do I know considering the fact that correlations are time varying plus uh, I mean, they're never stationary. It's just they keep changing yeah. and they might be all over the place. So if you if you are a textbook investor right. or a paper investor, then you should only be a single factor. So you should not be a multi-factor investor. Because the single factor performance of momentum and value are through the roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 They, they just know one way to go, which is up. If you are a paper investor, but unfortunately, we aren't paper investors. Right. And we have a habit of looking at our portfolio values multiple times in a day. At least multiple times in a month, if not in a day. Right? I'm a long-term investor and my <coughs> horizon is a week. Absolutely. So with such long holding periods, <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, it's the other end of the spectrum, which is you diversify because you don't know in that particular holding period. So the problem is not that you'll get better returns, but that right. you will be forced to stick to the strategy for a longer period of time because you are right. not significantly disillusioned by underperformance. That is the whole logic. Got it. Uh, a simple equal weight combination of factors will obviously underperform the best performing single factor. That's right. a no-brainer. Right. 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 Uh, there's no question about it. And we have enough evidence to show momentum is phenomenal, value is phenomenal. But most, if you have a 10 year period of underperformance, will you even be invested for more than two years, three years? No, you won't. And then you will never find it. No time is going to be the right time to come back to this time. Because you, if you came back in the fifth year yeah. and you still saw another five years of underperformance, you are scarred for life. You are never going to touch value. Not even in a multi factor Stock market is, that. that's when the stock market is a scam. <laughs> that's when <laughs> it, it comes out. Scam. But anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah, so basically, you are scarred for life to an extent where you are never going to come uh, allocate to value even in a multi-factor portfolio. So it is uh, time varying. It is extremely part dependent, depending on when you enter, when you exit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For most of us who don't do it full time, uh, and even for a lot of us who do it full time, uh, it makes a lot of intuitive sense to have strategic allocations to factors and not be too cute with timing which factor to invest in at one point in time. And that's the whole appeal of multi-factor investing, which is. Uh, these correlations are time varying. Uh, performance is not consistent across various macro conditions. Eight times out of ten doesn't mean that fifty percent of the time you're going to be. It means eighty percent of the time you may be right, but that twenty percent can happen tomorrow, right? And you lose significant uh, capital as a result of that. So, uh, for people who don't do it full time and who, whose passion is not to you know see really which is the factor that's going to be best at a particular point in time. Right. Uh, the low path of least resistance and least friction tends to be a multi-factor approach. So uh, maybe let's say market beta, uh, which is typically like a passive index one plus an equal weighted combination of let's say the four or five major. It, I mean, does is that a reasonable approach for somebody who's naive? Absolutely, yeah. Got it. Uh, and since we since we last spoke, I think. Uh, the world has become a scary place, if I may. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> everything seems to have changed. Uh, at least, like, I'll start with the interest rates question. Uh, and of course, there's, there's a bunch of literature around uh, this one, you know, 
impact of interest rates on uh, factors. So have you looked at what interest rates do to uh, factors in the sense that what factor does well, what factor doesn't well, what's the impact of uh, interest rates on factors? What do we know? Um, it's like the inflation question on fire and ice, which I had mentioned, right, right. which is we don't have, at least in the Indian context, enough history of uh, rising rates, Got it. Uh, very recent history of rising rates. Uh, and a lot of times your you know, regimes are, def are defined based on certain static levels of uh, rates, etc. Whereas they should be taken contextually. Rate of 5% in India in a flat uh, or 0% interest rate environment in the US is very different from rate of 7% in India where US is 7.5%. Right? Uh, so, overlaying factors with macro is very tricky because macro is seldom one thing. It is yes, yeah. always a combination and confluence of various different things. And you can't control all your moving parts. And every time the narrative is different. Uh, maybe it is never different, but because of our limited understanding, we always look at a particular instance from a lens and the second instance from a different lens. Got it. And as a result, it kind of uh, you know gets muddled. Your analysis gets muddled because you are optimizing for your understanding. Right. Uh, which then becomes a garbage in, garbage out problem if your understanding is not holistic. So uh, people have attempted to do it. People have tried to, you know, have. It's like saying I can run a single factor regression equation versus uh, rates right. or factors, right? But if my error term is so high because I have left out so many different things which are, you know, definitely going to contribute. Uh, I know that as a prior that they are going to contribute, but I still want to take the results of my regression equation very seriously, then I am fooling myself more than right, right, right. <laughs> uh, more than trying to, you know, uh, be smart about it and savvy about it. Yeah. Got it. Uh, one final question on valuations. So, what's the interplay uh, of valuations versus factors? Like, for example, one uh, rule of thumb, if I may, comes to mind, uh, your, your starting valuations typically affect your forward returns over, let's say, 7 or 10 year period. Correct. Even when you look at CAPE or even some dumb Nifty versus PE correlations, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like a downward sloping time, uh, this thing. Does the same logic apply to factors as well? I think in the long run it does. Long run it makes sense to buy cheap and, you know, hold it. But it's like, again, saying, are you going to be a factor investor based on today's valuation for the next 10 years? Or you be able to realize that any Got it. Which oftentimes is not the case. Got it. So, uh, an interesting valuation metric which uh, we look at, especially for the value factor, I think uh, Cliff Asnes and Kaiser Lake, you are. The value spreads? They look at it, uh, value spreading. Right? Yeah. Uh, other people, well, then there are various ways to measure the value spread. People measure the difference in these scores of the portfolios. Some people measure the ratios. Uh, I think Corey Austin had an interesting debate with Cliff on what is the right of the coaches. But uh, what at least the consensus finding was was that 2021 end, the value spread was at its 99th percentile and it was yeah. perhaps yeah. higher than the dot com yeah. level also. Yeah. Uh, which is, and surprisingly, 2021 was not the first time when it was higher. Actually, it was higher in 2019 also. Oh, yeah. Or very close to that. Right. Now it's a no brainer to invest in value in 2019 if that is the case. <laughs> and you should have invested. And you would have been wrong by one and a half years. Right. And uh, that is a problem. That is a. So it is definitely, uh, you know, informative. And it is definitely something practitioners should consider while building up their book. But it's not a very handy timing to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Applies to the same retail logic also. Uh, when we last when I last published the episode, my title was this is a master class on factor investing and this has remained up to the building. Thank you so much for sharing your insane amount of wisdom and being patient in answering these questions. Uh, this was education for me. Uh, I'm absolutely privileged and grateful that you took out the time. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Rohan. Thanks to your team. And really enjoyed the conversation questions.